what do you want to talk about? I have some questions for you, but do you, do you have any um, concerns about me? You need to call me out. You want to do a little struggle session to begin with? That's, that's what, what I'm aware of. No, man, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you guide the conversation here whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. Then let's just dive in. Okay. What made you want to talk, um, speak out or, um, speak to your issues on the internet? Like what prompted you about that? Cause you're kind of, you're making, you're making arguments and essays on a kind of a conservative or right wing, but I will let you define your stance, but you're filling a niche. I wonder if you knew that there was a niche there or if you were compelled to speak. Uh, Not particularly. I uh, was in the situation where I've been really interested in politics my whole life. I worked in politics. I was a, a political reporter for a few years. And so I kind of had an idea about how this should work. Um, And then the more I watched kind of the sausage get made, and especially kind of the events of 2015, 2016, and beyond started to figure out things didn't work the way I'd been taught, uh, the way I understood them. And so I want to understand them better. And like a lot of people, I kind of looked to to different uh, avenues that weren't mainstream, fell a little bit down the YouTube rabbit hole, and discovered, uh, you know, different political thinkers that I'd never really heard of, even when I was studying politics in college and such. And so as I kind of learned more about them, I was like, well, this is really interesting. And I'm kind of going along this journey from very mainstream GOP conservative background to something else, but I didn't know what it was. And so I thought, you know, other people might find this interesting. I'll start talking about it and see if anyone, you know, uh, want, wants to kind of, you know, what, watch me go through this uh, and kind of hear my thoughts as I go through. And it, it turned out okay. That I had not expected the, it to go the way it has. So, No, you're very articulate. And again, you're, you're filling a niche. So uh, you started conservative then? Yeah, definitely. It, it w- I wasn't in a very political household. Uh, you know, my parents weren't, they, they didn't have the news on all the time that we didn't talk about it a lot. But we just kind of grew up in that part of America, went to church, kind of just naturally conservative in, in that way, organically so. And then I started to become interested in, in kind of the news that I heard. I listened to talk radio when I was like really young, that kind of thing. I was just, you know, super normal that way. And so uh, uh, it, it, I was very much a, a mainstream uh, Republican, like I said, worked in a little bit in Republican politics, that kind of thing. So that I was definitely like a talk radio conservative uh, for, for most of my life. Mm-hmm. What are the basic principles then, if you were even really cognizant of them? Well, you know, is you understand that uh, you, you want small government. That's really important. In fact, that might be the the most important thing with kind of the libertarian bent. That uh, especially kind of mainstream GOP. Uh, kind of entertainment politics had taken during that time. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you know that uh, you social issues are something that matter, but they're not the forefront of what the party's doing at that time. The, the, there have been a lot of wins in that area. So the, they kind of get brought up from time to time, but that that's not the biggest focus. It's really important to have strong national defense, you know, uh, that that kind of thing. So uh, you know, making sure that you have a well-funded military. The, the, again, you know, just the basic things that I think most people would absorb by watching, you know, Sean Hannity and listening to Rush Limbaugh, you know, mm-hmm. at that time. Mm-hmm. And then 2015, 2016 rolls around. You're in your uh, mid-teens, early 20s. And oh, no, I'm old. Yeah, no, I'm... Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> just getting out of college, that. really. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And but things are ramping up. And what, what did you start to see? And wh- how did that start to make you question things? And what were the questions that you started to ask at that point? Well, like I said, you, you look at what was going on with Trump, and you realize that all of a sudden there's a very different thing going on. You know, the the media is supposed to be. You know, like there's there's Fox News and there's MSNBC, and they have some bias here. But, you know, there's supposed to be some neutral arbiters here, like, you know, NPR and, 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 and these people. They're not supposed to be screaming about political candidates. They're not supposed to be doing these pieces where every single person who opposes them is, is you know, Hitler. And, and at that point, I kind of start thinking back. I'm like, wait, 
And they kind of said that about John McCain and that kind of thing, too. But this seems to have been taken to a different level. I guess it seems comic that they said that about John McCain at this point. But, you know, I remember when they were, you know, portraying him as some vampire who fed off the blood of children, um, which might have been more accurate than I understood at the time. Uh, but it's one of those things that, uh, like I said, it just seemed out of proportion to what was going on. There was this existential crisis just because this guy, Trump, who I didn't particularly feel one way or another about, seemed to be saying things that were, you know, just not allowed. They were bringing in conversations that I think conservative voters wanted to have, that the Republicans were interested in, but had just no one in the mainstream, no one who had any pull in the party ever really brought to the forefront. And kind of the extreme reaction to that really made me wonder what was going on here. And the more I looked at those issues, the ones that Trump were talking about, the more they seemed like the issues that most people actually cared about, but had just been pushed to the back at burner. And if democracy works the way it's supposed to, if this is really a representative system where the parties work through this marketplace of ideas, why would that be the case? Why would the issues that they cared about the most be the ones that the parties were most interested in avoiding? And of course, you see what happens with Bernie Sanders, all this stuff, and you start to wonder, you know, mm -hmm. is there a little more going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe on some respect, you see that there is this Overton window. It, it starts to become real in relief because there's this man, Donald Trump, who's acting outside of it. And that's causing the arbiters of discourse to uh, accelerate their rhetoric or turn up the heat on their rhetoric. And that makes you question like, oh, wait, uh, this was kind of invisible. Who's controlling the conversation? Now they're bringing a lot of attention to themselves because of their reaction to Trump. Is that fair? Yeah, that's absolutely right. You didn't even realize there was a frame, right? And all of a sudden, the frame is very clear and very constraining. It's making itself extremely obvious which is your first clue that something's wrong, right? Like, it, you shouldn't be seeing this. Um, but the people who are in charge seem to be willing to strain it, uh, you know, just, just to try to force Trump, you know, outside of uh, the kind of being a palatable option. So, yeah, that started to make it more obvious. And then, like I said, I started to look more into thinkers who explain politics differently than I understood it. And, you know, that's kind of where I ended up, you know, how I ended up here today. Yeah. The, so the uh, Republican Democratic duopoly um, was kind of like going from conservative to kind of liberal, conservative kind of liberal, but it was always going in the same direction. Uh, the, one of the memes, it's not even a meme, it's cliche, that there, it's two sides of the same coin. But basically what I see looking into what you've been looking into is that the same coin is uh, Cthulhu or... Um, the powers and principalities or the beast or the deep state or whatever that is. Like, it's just this huge bureaucratic rumbling. It's not really a country, but whatever controls the United States, the power um, and, and all the sluice ways of power, that is what has been allowing or constraining discourse between the Republicans and the Democrats. But it's always going in one direction. That's what I saw. Is that kind of the same thing? For you. Yeah, very similarly. I think there's a, a, a bunch of different reasons that's the case. Uh, on the moral end, I think uh, guys like Patrick Deneen was somebody who really helped me understand this in, in uh, why liberalism failed, uh, uh, because he talked about you know how liberalism had been cracked across the Democrats and the Republicans. You know, the the right in America got the economic half of liberalism and. Uh, the left got the uh, the social part of liberalism, and those are the only parts that ever win. You know, when the when the right's in power, it's all the economic stuff. When the left is in power, it's all the uh, social stuff that that tends to move forward. Though that's changed a little bit more now, as we see the parties start to shift and bleed bleed over in many different areas, be it defense and and all that different stuff. We're seeing a real a real change at this point, but it explained the the behavior up to that point. And then, like you said, there's also, I just haven't thought a lot about the mechanisms of power before that point. Like I said, even before, even though I had talked about politics, wrote about them, studied them, it was always more about the contemporary issues. Like I said, it's always very tightly inside the frame. You're never stepping outside of it to say, okay, but why does it function this way? Why did we receive these viewpoints? Are these organic? Or is there something else behind the reason that 
The different sides adopt them. Why is realignment in these issues seem impossible? Why do those issues only get put forward in certain areas? Why do you know? Why do corporations and NGOs and all these people, you know, uh, uh, large educational institutions, seem to consistently line up in a particular way, even though they're supposed to be competing in the political, uh, you know, game? Th- those are the things that made me wonder, you know, why are things organizing along those lines? And then, as you said there, uh, you know, people like Curtis Yarvin, and, and he's a good gateway to other reactionary thinkers that gave me a better understanding of kind of more how and why power is aligned the way it is. And as you pointed out there, Cthulhu or entropy the deep state, however you want to you want to describe that mechanism really makes a, a lot more sense than when you look at you know the way politics actually operates, especially in the United States, but the wider Western world as well. Yeah, there's I've been trying to make a tweet, formulate a sentence. That's what I mean, trying to formulate a sentence about reactionary, because it seems like the progressives are the reactionaries. Liberalism is the reactionary movement mm. um, but for some reason somehow the um, the conservatives or the restorers or the the preservers are the ones who are called reactionary that just seems like a sleight of hand but maybe the right wing called itself the reactionary but could you define what reactionary means reacting to what yeah well that that's the problem is it, i mean the, part of the issue is that that term is really more adopting the language of your enemy which is usually not a bad or is usually not a good uh, strategy but it, it's kind of what what's taken hold at this point it's got the same problem the conservative does right and this is a real issue for conservatives right now they aren't the conservative party at this point they aren't the conservative movement what's in charge right now is progressivism that's what dominates all of our social institutions. That's what do- dominates our corporations, our economic process, everything at this point. So the conservatives aren't actually conserving our system at this point. There are, the system has changed underneath them. And if they actually want to get anything done, they have to approach it in a very different way. Their conservatives see themselves as continuing a society that no longer exists it eroded underneath them and so that's the same reason reactionary doesn't really make sense at this point even though that's the label that's been applied really what is it what it is is people who are willing to take another look at liberalism and think outside of its barriers maybe these aren't the bedrock assumptions we should base our society on if that at this point that's what makes you reactionary even though actually you're the one with a more revolutionary system. Well, or radical, about. maybe even, right. if you're trying to get to the roots, to use sure. that very specifically. So when when one begins to notice that something is... When one becomes kind of awakened to the game and starts to look behind the curtain... Uh, sees that politics is actually kind of a sham show. There's a lot of different ways to get lost in going under the surface. There's conspiracies abound and it's really easy to impute intentionality where it's kind of a systems thing or any number of ways to the the imagination starts to hypothesize and seize the devil in any given detail uh, or, you know, constructs a devil out of any given detail. So, Moving from the surface to the depths, it's easy to get lost. What are the principles that have guided you in that movement? And then, you know, after we figure out how you began to interact with that, I'd like to see, like, what are some of the first things you came across? Well, like I said, first was really being able to step outside of the frame of how politics had been described to me. So things like the Constitution protects your rights, or that uh, if you properly set up a you know founding document for your society, that will in and of itself you know the, the rules are in place, they're written down for everyone to see, and so now you know everybody has to follow. We have rule of law, law, right, and that's just how it works. And that's a big part of conservatism, right? The, the, in a lot of ways, your your kind of mainstream GOP abandoned its attempt to follow religious conservatism and instead vested a lot of that spirit in the constitution thinking that kind of almost deifying the founders the founding and the constitution itself 
would be a way to work it around maybe the religious plurality or lack thereof that existed inside the U.S. at that time. And so the story of, you know, the right now is this, you know, my constitution will protect my rights and it will dictate the way that the government has to run, which means there are certain principles that I can take for granted. Like, uh, you know, if the left builds something that is really atrocious and gives them a lot of power, well, they have to be careful about that because eventually the right will take over the mechanism and they'll pay a cost for that. But then you figure out over time that that's not actually true. Um, actually, they just seem to accumulate power no matter who's in office. And so you start to realize that that mechanism doesn't work the way that you hope it would. You also start to look closer at things like representative democracy. Does it actually safeguard you against corruption? These kind of things. It should be pretty basic, right? You know that Congress has like a single digit approval rating but has like a 90% incumbency rating, right? So that should tell you something about the system and how much it actually represents the opinions of the voters. But for some reason, we never really seem to, you know, take a moment and, and delve deep into that. And then also, you know, obviously your Bill of Rights, your different constitutional amendments, these things, the separation of powers, these are all going to limit the ability of the government to infringe on these issues. But the more you think about it, you realize, well, actually, no one's taken the 10th Amendment seriously and like, over 100 years, you know, m most of these amendments actually are very easy to corrupt on many different levels. You have a lot of uh, processes that allow the system to manipulate outcomes so that they don't actually have to pay attention to things like uh, due process. We see that with all the, you know, things through colleges and the different cases, you know, or the different federal agencies that can basically have hearings that completely remove the process from the courts or the legislature, and you start to realize that actually most of this stuff isn't, you know, con con contained or controlled by the document that is actually supposed to be the building block of your society and the fairness that it purports to, you know, kind of uh, push forward. Mm -hmm. So one interpretation of the power, the de facto <coughs> rather than de jure, I shouldn't bring mm -hmm. up words that I can't really, but, so there's a law and then there's the fact. And yes, there's we yeah. there's difference. Right? Yes, you know there's there's due process and uh, there's accountability. But if you look at the executive branch, there's a bunch of lettered agencies that kind of just do their thing, and Congress kind of just gives them money. And then every once in a while, we have a new figurehead who's either more or less competent or more or less in line with these agencies that keep on going. So one way of interpreting that is to say that there's a cabal and that there, you know, there's these NGOs and you can follow the money and you see that there's these big players that are kind of manipulating the system. One thing that I find refreshing, it's maybe not just Yarvin, um, but maybe the Machiavellians that the, the, the which is a book, I can't remember the name. Burnham. Burnham. Yeah, Burnham wrote it. Excellent book. The analysis of power kind of has this, you're just looking at a system. It's not intentional. It's just kind of this beast. And you can just see that this thing, oper power operates according to power. It's not, there's people that get up and down inside of it. And there's people that can kind of move the levers, but it kind of just goes in one way. And I think that that, an, that analysis um, protects one from getting too conspiratorial, but at the same time, it's kind of nihilistic. There's something about uh, not even nihilistic, but kind of even apathetic that I see in Yarvin a little bit. He's really so hands off in a way. And I think it's kind of, I, I don't know if that's just his personality, but it kind of seems like uh, the Machiavellians, they try to get so distanced from power that they end up kind of just shrugging almost. It seems like on uh, on one level, when you start to deal with the power or look at the power, you kind of just say, there's nothing that can be done about this. There's really, it's, it's, it's all momentum and entropy. Um, what do you think on that? And how does some sort of reactionary spirit come to being when looking at a, just the huge system? Well, I think that, yeah, that's a really good point about kind of the Machiavellian political analysis, because the problem with Machiavellian politi political analysis is it works, right? Um, it, it very clearly defines the systems you're looking at. Um, and so that's why so many people, including myself, are taken with it because it's very effective. Uh, but the problem is exactly what you state. It won't let you escape it. You know, the, 
the problem with like really good systems analysis is it's entirely dependent on kind of the system. It, it's def it is defined by what it's defining. And this is what Oswald Spangler said about, um, uh, about kind of uh, the, the, a, at the end of a civilization is when the scribes actually start translating the realities of kind of the lived experiences into something concrete but it's not till the end of the process almost when it seems unescapable right and so th the problem with machiavellian polit political analysis is it says well this is exactly how power works and there's really no way out of it right i mean to be fair to people like pareto there he does say like there is something that happens it's the circulation of elites and your circulation of elites can happen in a number of different ways but the one that he says is most likely in a scenario where your elite is made up almost entirely of what he calls class one derivations which are the people who are very interested in the life of the mind combinations people who work in ideas and information and obviously this is what rules our society at this point right mm -hmm. and he says what what's going to happen in those societies is basically your ruling class becomes so uh, uh they've become so removed from the actual physical necessities of life you know the, the the land the growing of crops the feeding of people the protection physical protection provided by police and and the army and those kind of things they they that is so much no longer a part of the ruling class that basically they lose their ability to exercise control over any of that and so uh, eventually they're they're like stranglehold on technology and learning and science and all these things breaks down because they have no connection to the more visceral parts of the society. And I think it's pretty easy to see kind of how that works, right? Because in most countries, when they start, your elites are martial in character, right? George Washington is the president because yeah. he was a general, right? And he got and, things done. He did the yes. thing, yeah. Yes. And, and of course, the idea that a president wouldn't have had any military service was pretty iffy, right? Like, obviously, we had presidents who hadn't been in the military, but being of someone who was involved in the military was a huge boon to your political career through most of American history, as it is through almost every other society in its kind of expansive phases, right? But as we kind of got to that late civilizational phase where our institutions take on this more, uh, you know, uh, scler sclerotic character, we get to this point where the manipulation of ideas is far more valuable than that like brute force lionish leadership that kind of your martial class can uh, provide and so your entire elites become dominated by these you know but by, by kind of these crafty foxes rather than these brave lions and that's great for a while because they solve really complex problems, right? Like they make your your society prosperous, and you can you can create uh, large amounts of wealth, and you know heal diseases, and all kinds of amazing things. But like I said, eventually we just get to this point where the people running the system have no actual connections to the thing, the, like the basic things that make life work. Which is why you see people like uh, Justin Trudeau battling against truckers right because he's now lost contact with any of the people who actually like make his society run in a very real material sense his his voter base his power it all comes from manipulation of language and information you know how does he shut down the trucker protest does he send in a bunch of police does he send in the military no he stake, steals their bank accounts, right? He shuts down the bank accounts of their of their families, and that works for a while. The, 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 a lot of the Western leaders will continue to do that kind of thing, but eventually that breaks down. Uh, and so that's one thing Prado says that can kind of cause this to to fall apart. That's one way to escape the cycle. But I think there's also the fact that eventually. Uh, again, this is something Spangler talks about, is eventually people walk away from civilization. He, he predicted that people would walk away from science, which sounds crazy at the time. But then you think about how two plus two equals five at this point, and actually, you know, math can be racist and all these other disciplines, unless they're properly intersectional, aren't, you know, of any value. And you start to see how people are in many ways walking away from academics, from, uh, from science, from all these other disciplines towards something that is much closer 
to religion, even if it's still wearing the trappings of academia. Or and so I yeah. Exactly. And and so I think uh, in many ways we will see um, we will see an escape from the system, but it won't come through Machiavellian political analysis, even though that will accurately describe, I guess, what we're going through up until the point where it doesn't. Yeah, it it reminds me um, I'm not qualified to make a complete analysis of this, but it reminds me uh, one of my friends, Brett Weinstein, he's an evolutionary biologist and he has this evolutionary theory and he's very articulate with it and it can explain so much. But whenever he speaks with a th- theologian specifically other people too, he he's trying to define how the system can be overcome, but all he has is the ability to describe the system. And I, I, that is the similar with Machiavellians, that they, they can describe a system, but at some point, something new comes into being. There's an emergence or an emergency, or even if you want to get religious, there's these revelations that have impacts that are not seen by the system and then reshape it in some way. And that it seems like that's not a science, that's kind of an intuitive process to be aware of how that could break through, unless you've seen that there is some sort of way of becoming perspicacious or aware of how new systems coming to be or new um, re-exertions of morality or brotherhood or community or like a, a snapping back into a common humanity within any given system like the United States. Yeah, I think it's very easy, whether it's politics or evolutionary biology or the marketplace, to try to, everyone wants to create a unifying arbiter, right? Like a a system that explains everything. Everyone wants to predict pretty much forever what's going to happen next. Actually, that's pretty much what our managerial elite are are designed to do right they the best way to manage a mass body whether you know be your a company or a nation is to basically reduce variance as much as possible so that you can standardize the application of of management techniques and so you want to make sure that everything fits in boxes it's really important that everything is like fungible that everything can be explained by the same process you can't have (laughs) barriers of different understanding you can't have biology over here and religion over here and economics over here and politics over here everything has to be one thing and i think one of the (laughs) biggest problems that you find is whether it be people like me who are using machiavellian analysis or brett or or economists everyone forgets the purpose of lenses right everyone says well i've created this lens and it allows me if i close one eye then I can see clearly through the other this one thing, but they forget that they close the eye, that there's still a whole nother world happening outside of that perception. And so we've created a number of very complex lenses through which we want to view the world. And what we have is a bunch of people who are all screaming, my one lens is the only one that provides the total understanding of what's going on. But that's a huge mistake. That was never true. It, it, we created the lens for a purpose, but you forgot the purpose and you made you made uh, validating the lens the most important thing because we're now a civilization of specialists, right? That's what makes you valuable, whether you're the best MMA fighter or the smartest political guy or the best biologist or the best politician, what makes you valuable is your specialization, not your diversification. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that the thing you specified in, the thing you spent your entire life making sure is the best, the thing you're best at is the most important thing. It's really important that that's the case. And so I don't think until we kind of remember that we closed an eye and that we're looking at the world through something that by definition distorts it. I don't think we can get back to the point where we can kind of bring these things together and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of synthesize something that will make things work. Well, there's a, you're making me think or imagine that there could be a, (laughs) a political, um, position that allows for, you know, like a a liberal marketplace. And by liberal, I don't mean the political agenda. I mean, 
polyphony and uh, pluralism of ideas, like some sort of network of communication or a communication protocol, maybe centrist, maybe conservative, maybe liberal in the capital L sense that uh, allows for the right people to come together in the right way and begin to... Uh, kind of make a steeple out of their lenses or lend their lenses to one another and be able to to function together in order to get something done or create a more accurate, fuller picture of the world in order for us to, you know, write another document or figure out what happens next. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, that would be nice, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think what you're far more likely to see is the kind of liberal detente between the friend enemy distinction fall apart you're probably far more likely to see the fact that there's a lot of um existential um competition between ideas uh that we've papered over uh ideas that were never going to coexist we've attempted to make coexist for a very long time hmm. through kind of the the obfuscation of liberalism and i think you're going to see that become increasingly clear that that doesn't work i think we're seeing it now uh it, can we give an example it could be uh, what uh you and uh, sargon or benjamin and, and carl benjamin and what i and carl benjamin were talking about about these different ideas that are trying to get along but don't mm -hmm. really get along and they're starting to clash sure I mean, e either, for instance, either there is a natural order by which, for instance, the family is a valuable unit to be protected inside your culture, and that means that you have to cede some level of autonomy um, and authority to parents inside that unit, or the state can force you to respect the gender identity of your kid. Those are two things that cannot simultaneously exist. They, they, it's not a small issue, it's a, it's a fundamental existential issue. They, they can't exist under the same order, right? Um, and so at some point, um, our attempt to negotiate those two positions, which could never be negotiated at any time, uh, it becomes clear that, that that's not going to work. Um, and again, we're seeing that now, right? We're seeing the state attempt to um, enforce a particular agenda in those, and you're, and you're seeing the pushback. That's just one of many, many, many areas in which we, realize, we, we can quickly realize that uh, the two positions cannot exist simultaneously. Uh, and I think we're far more likely to see those things come apart than we are to see a new synthesis um, reestablish kind of that liberal detente once again. Okay. Detente? Is that like where, where the pasta is really crispy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I'm using it correctly, right? Like, the, 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 but, but I, I think that um, uh, they're going to... We, we, we told ourselves we didn't have to resolve issues of meaning, issues of purpose, issues of morality, as long as we could find a minimum acceptable morality that everyone could function with inside the marketplace. And that worked for a really long time, yeah. right? Okay. That, that, that seemed like a good sell uh, at, at the moment uh, because it allowed us to, to cooperate economically and, and do all these other things and cross barriers that otherwise civilizations wouldn't have been able to cross. Mm. But those issues never went away. They never actually, we never actually solved any of those problems. We put them down the road as long as possible. And the whole time, actually, we were making decisions on those issues in the background, even though we told people we weren't. Well, and, or the decisions were always kind of aligning toward the power of the state, the system yeah. itself, like Correct. the pr procedure keeps on proceeding. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and it's always the proceed and the and the state always wants to accrue more power, so it's always making the decisions in the direction of massification and centralization of the state, um, which is why economically it moved right and socially it moved left because in both cases that's what you need to destroy barriers uh, of of social competition, right? So you needed to remove the influence of the church and the family. Uh, you, but you also needed to commodify 
uh, things that had once been sacred. Uh, you needed to do both of those in order to grow the, the state. Uh, you need to, and so that's why it's all, it was the, we were always moving this direction, even though we never talked about it. We, 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 uh, said instead that we were negotiating this when we really weren't. And so now kind of all of those things are coming to a head. All the, all those sharp edges didn't, that didn't actually get smoothed over mm -hmm. are, uh, now we feel like we're at sword point, uh, because we are in a lot of ways. James Lindsay, who is um, a frequent user of Twitter.com or the application, if you have a smartphone, he uh, he goes on different tears. He has an idea and he, he really pushes it really far. And one, of, he's pretty edgy sometimes. You don't really know what he's saying or it requires some interpretation. But there was a photograph of, I believe it was either the Navy or the Marines marching up a hill and they were carrying a pride flag. And he said something to the effect that th they're flying enemy colors. And that was uh, interpreted by the left-ish people as him being homophobic, that he's calling uh, homosexuality evil or the gays are uh, the bad political party. But if you actually look at the branding with Pride Month in the the United States State Department, which is now implicated or impl yeah, put into effect a Department of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, which is again the state codifying the personal and bringing it into itself in a way. But there's this photo on the masthead of the uh, Department of Equity within the State Department and also on the State Department's webpage and their Twitter is a photograph of officers taking down the American flag and kind of crumpling it up and then very lovingly putting up the pride flag. And it is kind of obvious that pride, whatever pride is, is the new order. That is the, the state. It seems mm -hmm. like, or that is a symbol of the state. Now, what does that symbol actually mean? It does mean a lot, but we don't really know what it means because they're selling it as acceptance, diversity, inclusion. Again, it's this obfuscation, but it's a new moral order being explicitly, is explicitly replacing the United States. Yeah. So what does that mean? And uh, what's the proper way to react to that or to point it out even? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's exactly right, of course, and, and is that think think about um, when, you know, the Supreme Court was making its decision on gay marriage, right? Uh, it's doing Oberfeld or however you pronounce it correctly. Um, if you had explained to the average person who supported uh, gay marriage at that point, that once this was passed or once the, the Supreme Court made this decision, Within like about a decade, you would have the pride flag flown instead of the American flag. And you would have like trans kids and, and, uh, and uh, drag queen story hour. That person would have called you insane, right? They, they would have looked at you like, okay, Jack, uh, the uh, chick track guy, like, okay, radical, you know, Jerry Falwell person. Like, yeah. I'm sure that's what's going to happen, right? Uh, people were warned about all this stuff. And then they get here and they say, how, how did this happen? Well, we know exactly how it happened. It, it, it was always going to go this direction, right? Because once you fundamentally change the definitions of basic building blocks of society, there's really only a couple things your society can do at that point, which is like completely reorganize itself from the ground up around this new narrative or fall apart, you know? And so that's what our society did. Uh, it, it became essential for this to become the new organizing principle of the United States. To be fair, this didn't start with gay marriage or any of this stuff. We've been doing this since at least the 1960s, right? The civil rights story has completely supplanted whatever America was supposed to be, especially for the left, but now increasingly for the right as well. And so the the only way to frame almost any conversation is in the frame of civil rights. Civil rights are what defines the United States. The United States was born in sin and iniquity, but what makes it but 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 what gives purpose 
to the elite now is their ability to rescue these plebs from their backwards ways and bring them ever closer to the perfection of equality and diversity and all of these things. And so that's why once you've solved one issue, be it, you know, uh, slavery or interracial marriage or gay marriage or whatever, you always have to move to the, to the next smallest uh, issue because you need to generate that revolution again because that's literally the entire narrative, justifying narrative of kind of your society and what holds it together. There's nothing else binding it together morally or narratively at this point so that's what you've got okay this is this is a really dangerous narrative we unless unless you go so reactionary and to say that some people belong some some races should be enslaved and like how far back do you go um with progress before you say uh, that that's enough just too far like uh, in other ways, in other way of putting things, are you saying that ending slavery led to uh, transing, ch castrating children for the sake of an identity? Is that of a piece? Is that one moral fabric? Or is, are you describing a process, an attitude towards how we change slavery or how we uh, rethought racism was, about, was in a revolutionary mindset? It could have been done in another mindset with the same result without the same consequences. Yeah, I, I like to be clear, like I don't think slavery is necessary for like an ordered society. That's in, that's insane, especially well, I, today. Aristotle no, thought I it, so, you know. But yeah, fair enough. Well, that's not exactly what Aristotle thought, but we don't have to dive into that. Okay. Um so uh the the point is that this became the binding much like the constitutions um deification became the stand-in for conservatives uh, about like what would be the binding narrative of the United States. The civil rights revolution became the binding narrative of what the country could be for the left. And like I said, now it is pretty much for the right as well. No one has the ability to frame anything in any other way except like what kind of rights it's going to bring. Uh, and it's the only narrative that we have. We're, we're not narratively together as a people or as a religion. There's no moral binding beyond our ability to have these civil rights revolutions. And so we need, like I said, to find these ever smaller things we can focus on that will, again, give us that it will a bind us together and B grant the government the authority to once again, go around whatever due process or other things we've created. I don't know if you've ever heard of Christopher Caldwell, but he has this great book called uh, Age of Entitlement. And he basically explains uh, that the civil rights uh, decisions and codifications into law basically created a second constitution that certain members of the uh, of the country have that allows them to operate outside what we think of as due process and everything else. And so because this was such a valuable tool, everyone wanted to expand their ability to access this secondary constitution. And so that's why mm. it became really important for every change to now happen in the same way this thing that we said was only for this emergency so they could move forward a worthy cause suddenly became the default mechanism by which all social change happened and that's why our social change has accelerated in the manner it is or it has and the reason every group has to become the next new civil rights group because if you don't have access to that civil rights constitution well, then you're kind of a second class citizen, actually. Uh, when, when, and so it's really important for each new leader to adopt the mantle of some form of civil rights leadership if they want to be able to bypass things and gain access to special abilities inside the government, corporations, all these other mechanisms inside our society to move their agenda forward. If it's not a civil rights issue, it's basically not an issue. Wow. Okay. So again there's the method of achieving a goal which is what you're talking about and it's called civil mm -hmm. rights but if you sure. actually look under the hood of it it's a special power that redistributes rights or power according to a very simplistic narrative around oppression and liberation is that more or less accurate is it kind of like yeah Marxian i think that's a fair liberatory that's okay. a fair understanding sure so we can still is it possible to still have the gains 
without that power, without that procedure in place? Can we still, I don't even like thinking this way, end racism, which is the zero COVID of the civil rights movement, yeah, yeah. Right? But still, like, yes. how do we, how do we uh, move towards a society that focuses on the human being as a human being, not as a functionary of some sort of political class or social class or race or something like that? And is the civil rights, the, the mechanism of it is distinct from the morality of it or the, or the, the, the justification for it to exist in the first place. I just, we so, need to separate those things so people don't go around and say, this is the problem with the right. You're like, oh, so you want us to go back to slavery? Like, yeah. n- like you need to make a clear separation. So, so the problem we're going to run into is um, one of like basic axiomatic um, uh, adoption of, of like terms, right? So like you, if, if you're saying the progress there, right? So you're assuming in all civil rights cases that something is progress. Now you and I would both agree that the ending of slavery is progress. That is, that is a good thing, right? So that is something that we both agree. But most people who, well, I shouldn't say most people, but a lot of people on the progressive left would say that, you know, uh, tra- the the moving forward of trans issues is progress, right? So what we're really doing is now is we're saying, by what shared definition will we gauge progress, right? You can't just, and, but the problem is when you say the term civil rights, suddenly anything that was achieved through the mechanism of civil rights is civil rights, right? It, like it's internet all one or, thing. Um, water or um, housing, uh, everything. The encroachment of civil rights thinking can just be everything down to you have to force 10 year olds to call a girl a boy or that is violating a civil right. We have to actually like everything has to get into every nook and cranny. That's the key of the narrative is it's all one thing, right? So if you are not forcing, you know, eight year olds uh, to be addressed by their preferred pronoun or forcing parents to uh, to refer to eight year olds by the preferred p- pronouns, you want to bring back slavery, right? It's all one thing yeah, that that's the, that's really essential. And so it, and so as long as that's the only narrative by which we understand our country, if that's the only thing that grants value or moral validity to something, we're always stuck in this trap and we're always doomed to accelerate because there's there's no way to justify anything else. I think that honestly, the best solution would, of course, be the ability to differentiate. Uh, you know, it would be actual, hopefully, one day federalism, right? If you have one state with a particular set of values, they can make determinations on how they're going to treat the people inside their state. And if another one has a different decision, they can do that. But of course, we don't allow that at all. The civil rights revolution means everything is universalizable, right? You can No, they march- say it explicitly. Uh, uh, MLK yeah. said it. Uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It's totalizing. Correct. Totalizing. Yes. And- Exactly. And so there's no way that you can allow, you know, Alabama or Georgia or, you know, South Carolina to have a different value system than people in California or New York, because those are Americans who are being oppressed by ignorance, right? And it's your duty to go in and free them. And this is a mechanism of great power for progressives, right? This is what activates their their uh their base right whenever they can find another place which they can push these boundaries another place where they can force these rubes into civilization and progress that's what gives them that feeling of victory that's why the civil rights narrative is so important to their coalition because it gives them infinite power basically to apply across states and domains as they please so the problem then is to combat that on some level and if somebody's of the progressive mindset i guess we could do like some sort of psychological analysis like jonathan Haidt does where we say okay there's these people with these values or this person with this anagram or there's 12 different houses of political thinking or whatever um and then try to like hone the message to different moralities there's that way of approaching it but 
first and foremost, it seems like the system is careening towards collapse on a number of different levels or, or degeneracy, even though I, I can see it like collapsing and sustaining itself in the same sort of perpetual entropy uh, mechanism. But it just seems like some sort of awakening or some sort of opting out or some sort of counter narrative needs to be put in place or at least surfaced as an as an, uh, an another option. Is that true or what? Like, what, what, where do we go from here once we diagnose this? Well, that's the, of course, that's the, uh, the ten million dollar question, right? Is what, what do we do now? And nobody knows, and that's why everyone's standing around paralyzed because we kind of got to the natural end of liberalism, and no one knows what to do at the end of the party. Like the magic is gone. So what do we do now? For a lot of people like James Lindsay, it's kind of reset it back to the 90s, right? Like roll it back, uh, earlier patches, a lot of the IDW guys, this is the plan, right? Is like, well, it was fine, right? Like like leftism was fine until, you know, it got weird about 10 years ago. And if we can just get it back to where it was before, we can kind of resume the infinite progress thing and and get humanity back on track but of course they don't realize like the slippery slope was real the whole time and you got here because everything that preceded this let us know this was going to happen and so if you roll if you could roll the whole thing back a couple decades which you can't but even if you could you would only inevitably bring yourself back to this position right and then you've got conservatives who in many ways kind of want to do the same thing but rolling the whole thing back to i don't know the 50s or something right which i think to be fair is a relatively better you know version of society in some ways obviously not others but I think that you're still going to end up in the same problem, right? And so the the thing everyone's trying to figure out is, I don't think anyone has a, a, to be honest, myself included, has a complete vision of the future that escapes us beyond, you know, beyond this. Because I would, like you said, I was talking to Carl Benjamin about this. Whatever comes next will be necessarily post-liberal. It will speak the language of liberalism. It will use its words. It will even, in many ways, wear its values forward in 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 some way. But just like you know, uh, just like Caesar or um, uh, or Octavian didn't declare that the Roman Republic was over, right? He said, "I came to save the Roman Republic," right? And the same thing is going to be true for liberal democracy and, and everything around it. Whatever comes next will use much of its language. It will still keep some of its institutions intact. Theoretically, the Senate will still exist, but they will no longer be the real force behind the system, much in the way that actually they're not now, right? Yeah. In many ways, we're already well beyond uh, democracy. the Democratic Republic that, that yeah. we pretend still operates operates our society. I think that'll just be as true socially as it is politically uh, once we get to whatever comes next. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, taken or uh, find um, it fascinating or attractive Yarvin's monarchism? Or maybe Matt Walsh's theocratic fascism? I think that's a joke that he has in the bio, but I don't know. <laughs> Probably, but we'll, yeah, I don't think the Daily Wire is uh, pushing that hard through that door, but we'll find out. Yeah. Um, I think that there are much better organizing uh, mechanisms okay. for governments. Um, I think monarchy is probably improvement. I think democracy is just not real. Um, it, it always devolves it very feels quickly real. into a. It, it sure does. That's the great thing about it. Um, uh, but uh, I think there are better ways of ordering the political structure. But that's not really, at the end of the day, our problem. Our problem is not one of systems. Uh, again, this is one of the things that Yarvin is brilliant at, but also traps him, right? He's a systems analyst. And so systems are always the solution, right? If you line up the incentives correctly, if you redo the wiring, that'll solve the issue. Our issue is far deeper, 
Uh, you know, a lot of people, especially people on the right, conservatives, they love to quote the Constitution or the founding fathers talk about the Constitution saying things like, you know, uh, I think I think it was uh, John Adams who said, you know, the Constitution is only for a moral people who follow the Ten Commandments and it can't properly govern any other. You can find a bunch of quotes this way, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, the, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin talking about the necessity of a virtuous and moral people in order to operate the society. Th- they understood that uh, for the republic to function, for self-government to be a thing, the character of the people was an essential element. And when that broke down, it doesn't really matter if you still have the skeleton of a republic yeah. standing around. That that ship has sailed. And the problem is we have invested entirely in the structure of our government and our system to solve our problems for us rather than understanding that it's actually the character of our people, the people that we're producing. We don't have the leaders we want because we don't have a system that could possibly generate them. Uh, we don't have the kind of people who self govern because we specifically went of our, out of our way to strip all the intermediate institutions inside society that provide people the ability to have non-governmental autonomy and still have a functioning society. Yeah. And so, how do you rebuild social fabric is a much bigger problem than let's just make a monarchy. Even if I think maybe that might be a better system, that doesn't really solve your issue. And Yarvin will tell you this. He says, you know, the the reason you need a monarchy is the people are are too corrupt now and they can't run a republic. So you need a monarch because that's the only way you're going to get things done. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the perennial question, it comes back, and there's different ways of thinking about this, uh, literally or figuratively, but the religion question, whether it's just uh, a loose enough set of stories with values that get people in the same room, uh, singing some songs, doing some silly dances, that in and of itself would provide cohesion. You know, there's problems with religion th- theologically or theoretically that people have, and we have all these debates about doctrine and belief and spaghetti monsters and stuff like that, but the truth of it, the de facto truth of it is that it binds people together. It creates pickup groups. It creates bowling leagues. It creates, from that flows the interaction of different families together and then the kids get to hang out and the adults get to hang out and there's that community so i don't know if we can approach that without religion or not what's your yeah what's no your we absolutely can't religion but i don't think we, i don't think we ever i don't think we ever escape religion like i don't think there's such a thing as a secular society okay. we've renamed it we don't we don't have uh, the the religious book or we don't have the metaphysical deity but every every society has a shared um, language, a a shared set of moral assumptions it makes if it functions at all. Increasingly, we don't have that, which is why it feels things are coming apart. But we at least had like this loose version, like I talked about with the Constitution and civil rights and those things. Those things kind Mm. of held us together for a while. They they were a, a terrible religion, but it's what we had. And, and so what we're seeing is really the failure of our current religion to bind us together. We'll get a new one. Something hmm. will come along. Hmm. What it will be, uh, you know, is, is anyone's guess. I, I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's very essential for you to have them. But the other problem is I see a lot of people try to pick the religion, right? They're like, well, you know, we need to, the problem was like Christianity just didn't do this or, or, you know, uh, modern progressive liberalism just didn't do this. And so, We've got to install a new religion that will, you know, have the best, you know, setup going forward. But that misses the whole point. Like the reason religion works, the magic behind the religion is everyone believes it implicitly. Uh, you don't just go around selecting the religion that, like, that. Op- the problem is trying to optimize your religion on a spreadsheet is the least religious thing you could do, right? It is. It is the. Mm. It is the exact wrong way to understand it. And so, when, oftentimes, when I talk to kind of rationalists, those kind of people, they're like, "Well, we'll." just we'll just engineer you know the best the best thing through this is like no you're 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 strangling it in the crib like it'll you'll never get the function the reason it works is you don't have to think about it right the the reason it works is it's an implicit shared language and culture between people in many ways it's got to be somewhat organic it's going to come top down in in some ways because your ruler is is going to impose some system of beliefs to like make Constantine. their Im- 
or exactly or or an fdr um they're 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 going to impose this uh through their institutions one way or another that's going to happen but there also has to be some kind of organic um kind of spark that allows that to take a foothold you can't really just directly graph an alien religion that you engineered onto a society esperanzo the religion (laughs) right yeah yeah, exactly so so you've got to have you've got to have something that really does have something grounded in in truth that kind of binds your human spirit together you have to acknowledge the existence of metaphysics to make it work and if you're not willing to do that you're always just going to have a giant hole in your analysis and understanding Mm -hmm. of society and Mm -hmm. the way that we function as humans uh just a a side note we don't have to get lost here what do you mean by metaphysic uh, there's something beyond the direct physical observable world. Um, you can't quantify, you can't put under a microscope. If you don't want to, uh, you know, immediately adopt, you know, the Christian or the Muslim understanding of that, that's fine. You'll get there eventually. But if you don't understand that there is something beyond the material world, um, then you will never understand how humans function because we necessarily embrace that. Even like super wildly autistic Machiavellians like Pareto kind of just took that on board. Like he wasn't a religious person, but he created these residues, right? Which are just like these blunt facts about society that exist, which is just another way of saying God made us that way. But you okay. can't say that. So we've got to have a, a more you know, uh, a more academic way to, yeah. to describe the same phenomenon. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago on Sunday, you posted on Twitter a picture of Jesus with a little baby Pepe at his yes. knees. Yes. What, what was that? What were you telling us about your religion when you posted that? Uh, I was literally just wishing the people who I'm friends with a, a happy Sunday and hoping that they have a, a good church service. Yeah. And so that's the, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, Pepe's uh, on the Internet and uh, many of those who are uh, see themselves kind of, I guess, as right wing identify with it. It's a very weird thing. It gets applied to at this point. It could, you know, uh, Carl Benjamin uses Pepe, you know, and then so, you know, there's not a particular religious connotation, of course, to it, but you know, it's, it's a friend group, you know? Okay. Uh, there's just, I, I know you didn't mean anything by it, but there's a meaning there. There's a, one thing that's fascinating about the right or the new right, whatever this area is that you're on and uh, a lot of other people are on, is that there's this creativity, this meme thing, this edginess to it, this cartoonishness, this uh, brouhaha. There's something fecund and a little smelly about it. There's something rich about it. It's like a sourdough. It's on the counter a little too long. And that, and that, that little image that you showed uh, kind of just events that or, or connected with that. There, there's there's a vibe over there um, that I think is there's something there. I don't know how to conceive of it anthropologically, but even though there's a lot of infighting, like weird groups like the anime profile picture people and then the Greco-Roman profile picture people, and yeah. they all kind of have weird kind of actually like very right or extreme uh, viewpoints on these different ways are you aware of that are you uh are, have you conceptualized I, I, about that at all i i know there's a lot of people who really delve deep into like the different factions of like online right people and, and all that stuff yeah. okay and it, it's valuable i like i'm sure there's there's people who are much better than me i don't know each and every one of them uh i just know there's a shared language it's what okay. you're noticing is cu- is culture right okay. you're you're noting you're noticing organic culture maybe some people mean one thing by it maybe some people mean another by it okay. um but if you see it in context often enough then it becomes something that i think uh you know even if you don't agree on everything which no society or culture does it's something that you at least recognize and appreciate and understand leftists have this all the time in their language right they do this all the time you know the words progressive and progressive and inclusive and and on all those things those things are in group language right by by using the correct buzzwords okay. by the even if even if you're in one portion of the left or the other you understand well this person is on side or shares something with me or has something and so i think you're just seeing the right having something similar that exists outside of the I academic guess. La- language it's it's non-priestly language yeah. it's graffiti it, it's uh yeah 
yeah it's 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 um it's like duck dynasty is to like i guess maybe more gop you know uh you know mainstream conservatism okay. yeah right and it's it's something that they make in jokes about uh someone shows me a duck dynasty meme i'm like what like i don't understand it right away but like my family does they get it immediately right like they, they it's something that they they and their friends immediately understand they have a shared reference point because they understand that culture and the things around it mm-hmm. so i think um it's just a version of that i mean i you know uh, people can ascribe all other all kinds of other things to it i guess but th- that's how i understand it so where are you headed do you have like a grand plan uh, is, no. Insofar as no. you want to reveal it, okay. So no, you're pleading no. the fifth there, or you're just saying no. You're you just go from topic to topic and just pick up. Yeah, games. I, yeah. I, I really am not a trained academic. I'm not a, a you know a high level professional of any kind. I'm shocked to find myself in the very you know odd position I'm in. Um, I do my best to kind of understand, you know, the things I'm looking at and weave them together into something that I get. I have some under, I guess if there was one thing I could say about what I've been fascinated by, it's this, it's the tower of Babel. Um, everything I look at, everything I look at feels like we're moving towards, a centralization that eventually leads to things falling apart. Um, It feels that way culturally. It feels that way politically. It feels that way economically. And so I'm searching for ways to better understand that. That's why I think the Machiavellian elite theory provides some of that. That's Mm -hmm. why I'm very interested in the work of Bertrand de Juvenal and Oswald Spengler um, and uh, Alistair McIntyre from whom you might might suggest uh, uh you know my name came from uh that i each one of those has some piece of the elephant of what's happening to our society that i'm kind of fascinated by and that's what draws those interests together for me more than anything else that's probably not a great answer for people who are like hoping for a grand unifying academic theory um but it is what has drawn my interest to those different thinkers and the way they approach things and understand them. Mm-hmm. The, the, the cycle, like the, the way that the world operates right now, and maybe it's just a illusion of Twitter, but because so many people believe in the illusion of Twitter, it's basically a political reality insofar as people are using this to connect and then showing up in the streets. And the current thingism where everybody's attention converges on one topic very intensely and then on another topic very intensely. And then there's these little dips where know nothing topics like Amber Heard and Johnny frickin' Depp become like the the thing or some some one actor slapping another actor become a thing which are like non-issue issues there's uh I I I get exhausted by it I have like I have a relationship to that but like that as a political way of being in the world is interesting I don't know how stable it is and I'm thinking right now about the Supreme Court and how they're making a number of decisions that are going to probably result in somebody God forbid getting executed or assassinated because they're tripping the left's trip wires so consistently and the uh the way that the progressive uh movement works is that they show up and they shout they clang the dishes this is kind of how they've been operating extremely graphically or uh, apparently since the inauguration of donald trump and then also in 2020 we can't forget that little experiment where the left was yeah, did what it wants to do. I don't even know if that's the left, but whatever that um, part of the culture does. I'm worried about that. What, what, what are your take on the way that people are engaging, let's say, with the Roe v. Wade stuff or, you know, any number of these different issues, but that specifically because it is what is consuming so many people right now. Yeah, no, it's it's really bad. Um, first, we shouldn't care this much about politics, right? And um, there's a lot of reasons we have to, unfortunately. Mm. Um, mm. 
And I, I understand the irony of someone who talks about politics all the time saying we shouldn't have to think about politics yeah. as much. Get off the internet, but, but keep on watching me. Get off the internet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I'm not I telling everyone subscribe. to touch grass. I, I would be the, the biggest hypocrite to do that. But, but I, as a society, it's really unhealthy that we have to constantly be obsessed with this. But we have to for a very simple reason. And that is, like I said, we don't share values. And we have these existential um, issues that we differ on. And we all know that if one thing goes one way or the other, you could lose, you know, the cultural battle. And so everyone is constantly, um, you know, obsessed with every little bit of this to the point where it then becomes entertainment, which is kind of why we're talking, right? Um, and, and to the point where the, the every it permeates every part of your society because there there's all this power up for grabs, right? There's a lot of ways to solve that problem. You know, Yarvin's you know uh, monarchy. The idea there is just the ruler, suck yeah. all of the power out of the room yeah. uh, by giving it to the monarch and then no one needs to compete in this way um that's a solution though uh there's there are many problems with that to be to be well fair. the transfer uh, the, of power is going to be really messy it well, I don't see how it doesn't but there's there's a there's a lot of um people uh yarvin is far from the first person to predict caesar um um in in this stage um and it's hard to say that any of them are wrong. Um, whether you like that or not, I don't know that you get to escape that reality. Hmm. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, like I said, a moral understanding uh, or, or religious understanding or a cultural binding is also necessary. But again, I don't think that happens until things decentralize. And I don't see any part of our government or our culture who's willing to release the stranglehold and let it happen. If we're very, very lucky, the Supreme Court decisions create a sorting mechanism that forces people to return to a system where they geographically move in proximity to people who they share values with. Our problem right now is that we're divided across the entire United States more by city and rural and even zip code inside city and rural than we are by actual geographic you know, uh, separation of values. And until you have communities that can bind together again by sharing similar culture and values, I don't see how you escape this problem because everyone knows that their neighbor next to them fundamentally disagrees with them on a whole host of issues and is spending like all of their emotional energy and much of their you know monetary uh, and, and other ability to like fundamentally alter the way your life is lived. Um, which is why everything feels like a disaster at this point, because the only things left are like society altering decisions. Like, can people get abortions? Can people practice religion? Can people decide whether or not they get a vaccination? Uh, can, uh, you know, you decide whether or not your children get to identify as a certain gender? Like, these are all, again, issues that can't coexist um and the and and the only way i think that we ever diffuse this um is if people return to a situation where they can share values and culture with their neighbor i don't think we're just going to create one grand unifying theory across the united states again and so the best thing that can happen is again hopefully hmm. actual federalism okay. where where you know people move to positions where they they don't have to live in the values of their opponents and what you are suggesting is that if we are lucky and it shakes out this way, the Supreme Court could be going through decisions and breaking up the central stranglehold that it imposed through itself on the United States of America and move towards states get to decide these certain things, not these other things, depending on what was written in the Constitution. Yeah, again, I don't see any of our... Um, I don't see any of our government institutions giving that power away voluntarily the supreme court will make some decisions that might force people to make those decisions and that's great but i still think you know it's been very clear like the doj came out against both the the uh the firearm decision and the abortion decision immediately after they're made that's not good news for those who are keeping score that your law enforcement is actively making its politics, its political opinions known. Uh, it's very clear that the, the Biden administration is probably going to choose to enforce laws 
it wants to and ignore the court. Uh, I, I don't I don't think, you know, it already does that in many ways. Uh, presidents always do in some capacity. Yeah. But I think we're going to see a lot more of that. What you're really hoping for is eventually as the competence of the federal government breaks down, and I know that's not a sentence anyone wants to hear as like the hopeful outcome, but as the competence of the federal government breaks down, uh, they don't get to make those decisions for regional uh, powers anymore. And you start to see like governors get to do their own thing. You know, you have DeSantis in Florida. He's kind of providing some kind of scaffolding for how that might work. Hmm. Other people might pick up that mantle. But as, as kind of the, you know, this is a very old system. Again, no one comes by and like bangs a gong and says the Roman Empire is over, right? Like no one tells you it's collapsed. You now live in a collapsed empire. No one does that, right? What happens is like the, the central power slowly over time loses its ability to manage its, you know, uh, different, uh, its different holdings. And and the regional autonomy necessarily returns. Uh, that's not always great because often they can't manage those <coughs> things. And so like bad things happen in the, yeah. in the meantime there, yeah. but that will allow these different States governors, whatever kind of is running those things, even if they don't de facto like secede from the United States, right. They'll, they'll functionally be independent in a lot of ways. In a way, Biden is the perfect incompetent and at the same time belligerent ruler for this kind of federalism to arise where the governors just say eh, no and what are you going to do cut off our schools well okay you already did that or whatever you know um but we'll see I, I guess it depends on how powerful the federal government is with funds at this point but if they tank the dollar then well that's a whole other conversation but still yeah, no, it doesn't I mean, seem I, like I, that I they have the immoral authority. It doesn't seem like Biden is necessarily yeah. anybody loves him. Enough. Yeah, yeah. Even the left, you know, you, you can see like uh, AOC through gritted teeth, you know, like, yeah, the president is doing a great job. Don't ignore the gun off the screen. Right. Yeah. Like you, you you, can see the in those conversations that no one has faith in the system anymore. And everyone is going through the motions because that's where the Gibbs come from. And that's where the power flows from. That's where the dollars come from. No one is really got the spirit of this. You've got the true believers who are still pushing these super fringe ideologies because like they understand that's how the power generates and there are true believers in those systems don't get me wrong it's not all cynical uh but the but the people who it feels like the people who operate the machinery it's it's not there for them anymore right and so yeah i i think it, i i think systems that are heading the way we're heading naturally produce the kind of leaders we have right like i said the the problem is not just lining up the 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 systems of power correctly it's that we fundamentally don't have the the institutional and cultural structures that produce the kind of leaders we want mm -hmm. and so we get biden's because they're easy to manipulate and we are a country that now run by people who uh, oligarchies who an oligarchy that operates a puppet to make the whole thing work yeah. so there it's the most valuable thing to them it seems like out for them because it uh, facilitates their power but anyone with any kind of foresight anyone who could escape their framework understands it's a dangerous game, but they're plugged into the network. That's where all their power and prestige and, and, and benefits come from. So they don't see it or understand it or operate it that way. Yeah. So where can people dive more into your beautiful mind? <laughs> uh, well, I've got, of course, the, uh, the, the Twitter uh, which has surprisingly been the most successful thing I did. Zingers, I did not man. expect that. Zinger after zinger. I, Good stuff. I, I, I did not. Like I said, I started a, I started a Twitter to shill my YouTube channel. That, that's why it existed. And then it, now it wildly outpaces it. Uh, but if you want the, the longer form stuff, then the YouTube channel. And then I also recently started a sub stack. Uh, where I'm uh, kind of doing uh, gives me the ability to write you know a little long more long form stuff and then I'm also kind of trying to put kind of a book together so kind of the the work in progress is being posted there yes. uh, as it goes by for people who want to check it out. This is a stupid question, so I should have opened it uh, opened with it open the conversation with it, but I'm gonna kind of close off of it. What what's your position? Are you NRX? Like what is your are you kind of like right-ish? Is there a thing sure. there? 
it, it's uh, I mean I would definitely I say I guess right wing would be the best e- explainer uh, because I use a lot of um, Yarvin and Nick Land and other thinkers in the NRX sphere because they were kind of my gateway into elite theory. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of people identify me in the kind of the NRX moniker, and I understand that, but I also don't agree with a lot of their conclusions. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't I don't wear that as like a badge. Um, so I, I think I think uh, I guess post liberal right wing or yeah. whatever you want okay. to call it would yeah. be the would be the most valuable thing to understand it if you want to try to put a label on something i don't know if you're 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 a gateway or like a veranda or maybe a vestibule i mean i don't know where people go from you or through you to wherever but you're nice again you're filling a niche and it's not radical in any way i mean it's radical in its thought but it's not radical and it's invective at all so i just really appreciate your work and your your essays are wonderful your video essays are just great they're bite-sized like here's right right wing thought and you're just going through and you're just cl- creating a great little treasure trove so i just wanted to appreciate no, yeah, no you thank you in that way yeah, yeah I, I i i don't have any like radical bent is the weird like i don't yeah. feel none of this like i just i didn't i don't want to be that person that's not like my you know personality i don't want to be like the the edgiest person in the room i just really find this stuff valuable like i i i, I think it needs to be explored and i think it's just i i look at people around me who are just like i don't understand what's going on and I just would like, I, I hope this helps, you know, I like it helped me and I hope it helps you. Here's my thought process and how I got there. And, and I hope that's, you know, and so if that takes them to a place that makes it easier for them to kind of understand what's going on, then that that's what I'm open for. Excellent. Excellent. Well, um, Aaron, you want to say goodbye to the people at home? I'm going to end the recording now. Thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun.